be seated. I love that line, that the living waters. You know, in the garden, when Adam and Eve were created, there was a river that flowed into the garden. No one ever questioned, when would that river run out? When would that river run dry? They knew that that river would always be with them. They knew that that river would always flow. And for Christianity, Christ is that living water. He'll never run dry. He'll always flow to his people, bringing joy and peace and love and grace. What a beautiful Savior we have who gives us constantly living water. As even as the deer panteth, our souls desires that living water. And he is Christ. What a beautiful reality. Well, with all that's going on, again, we don't have too many announcements going on with the church. So with that in place, let's pray and ask that the Lord would be with us. Let me fix my mic real quick. All right, let's pray. Our gracious God, you call yourself the Lord of eternity. The one who is the governor of all time and space. The one who has set forth the wheels of or you who are outside of time, you who are and conducting and orchestrating every single step of reality and time and space by providence. And Lord, it would help us this morning to understand what your providence is. It is your perfect, wise, supremely wise, carrying out of your decree, meaning That all that you give us, all that comes to pass, all that is before us, we can confidently say it has come, not by accident, not by mere chance. No, it has come from the very hand who created us. What marvelous God you are. What a Lord of eternity who can orchestrate all things, even using the decisions and the free will of man to orchestrate things. Not because he needs us, Lord, but because you are able to use us. You also decree the secondary means, Lord. Is this not a beautiful comfort for us to rest upon, that knowing you are the Lord of eternity, the one who has time in his hands, even this world in his hands. You, Lord of eternity, you who keep the stars and know them by, know them by name, you keep us and you know us by name. You who know the end already, From the beginning, you know what's going on in each of our hearts this morning. You, the Lord of eternity, the Lord of our hearts, we trust you, Lord. But we ask that you would increase our trust this morning. We have faith in you, but we ask that you would increase our faith in you. Lord, we believe. Help our unbelief. Help us, Lord. Lord, even what Job says, though you slay me, Yet we will worship you. Lord, even if the world is caving down on us, even if providence is not as light as we would like it, even if providence is right now are dark in some of our lives, though you slay me, we will worship you, Lord. You see, that's the joy of the Christian. Whether it's sunny days or rainy days, whether it's good providences or dark providences, the Christian's hope is in a steadfast God who is the Lord of eternity and knows every single detail of all of our lives. So Lord, we ask this morning that you would help us to praise you, help us to worship you, help us to glorify you, help us to know Christ from the text this morning. Pour out your spirit into our cup, Lord. And if our cup is too small, then Lord, increase our cup and even that it may flow, overflow with your spirit. And if that cup gets too small, Lord, give us a bigger cup to be filled with your spirit. The spirit of the living God who enables us and quickens us and helps us to receive Christ and to grow in Christ and to press on with Christ and to strive for Christ. Our prayer is so simple, Lord. We are dependent on you. We are needy of you. If you do not bless us this morning, if you do not by your spirit make your presence known to us this morning, if you do not open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive Christ this morning, all that we're doing is in vain. Our prayer is simple. Lord, help us. We need you. 
We plead before you. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing our final two songs of the beautiful name of Christ and the almighty King that we have in Him.
please be seated. We continue in the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, if you would please turn with me to the Gospel of Mark. We'll be in chapter 10 this morning, picking up where we have left off week in and week out. Mark chapter 10 will be in verse 32. Verse 32 of Mark chapter 10. I'll allow you guys to turn there. Mark chapter 10, verse 32, reads as follows. And they were on the road, going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, that is the disciples. And those who followed were afraid, that's the group with the disciples. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, We want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are saying. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among, among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Lord, as we begin, Lord, to open up your word, even as we just read the narrative, Lord, as we've read Christ's teaching, is it a bit confusing? Sure. Is there elements where we have to unpack? Of course. But may we not miss Christ in the text. May we not miss the gospel in the text as we're seeking to explain and exposit and exegete May it be a Christ-centered exposition. Help us, Lord. Help us to understand. Help us to, to rightly glean what you have for us in your word. Lord, we need you, even in this hour, in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, one great preacher, I was reading one of his sermons this week in relationship to service, and this is what he said. There have been thousands of enterprises undertaken by men when they have been put upon martial honor, which they would have never undertaken for mere fee fee nor reward. Men have gone to the cannon's mouth for sake of glory. And shall the Christian be altogether insensible to the motive of honor? Shall he not feel it to be his greatest glory to serve his God? And will there not be from this a stream of joy flowing over all of our holy work? In other words, what's this preacher saying? He's saying men have fought in wars. They've gone out to battle. They would have gone for free. They wouldn't have needed a GI Bill because they knew if I go to battle, I'm representing my family. I'm defending their honor. I'm going to fight against the enemy. They've done it. They've enlisted in the army of their country. 
As he said, they stared death right in the face, and they would have never done it other than for mere glory and for the sake of their family back home. And yet, what we find in Christianity is not the case. In Christianity, sadly, we find people who do not want to go to service in the king. We find in Christianity people allowing others to fight for them as they stay back. Remember King David. King David was supposed to be at war. King David was supposed to be in battle. But what did he do? He stayed home. And the idle man, the, the man who was not serving, is always the man who was tempted by Satan. Right? King David should have been out there. He should have been fighting. He should have been serving his God and his people. But instead, he stayed back. And this morning, we're going to see the same realities for the Christian. What is the Christian duty in life and in death? Primarily, it's to glorify God, but it's also to be able to serve one another. I, I truly believe that this element of Scripture, these verses in Scriptures, will help us to see this reality more clearly. But let's begin with the exposition in verse 32. He says, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them, and they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen. Jesus is determined, right? Can you just picture the scene in your mind? You have Jesus probably in front, the twelve right behind him, and then the masses behind them. You can already see what it looks like. The leader is in front, the one paving the way, the one who's determined. Perhaps someone is trying to slow Jesus down and tell him a joke, but he's so determined, he's ahead of them. He's walking with determination. He's resolved, and they're afraid. The disciples are afraid. Why are they afraid? Because you know what it is when you see that look in a man's eye. And he will stop at nothing till he achieves what he's been tasked to do. Maybe they're saying, oh man, he's serious. I can't even get him to play around, to tell a joke. He's going on to Jerusalem. He's beginning probably to think about what lies ahead. In fact, I know this because what comes next? He tells them, he pulls them aside, and he's telling them of his coming death, his coming crucifixion now this is the third time we see this right in mark chapter 8 and mark chapter 9 similar things jesus tells them of his coming death burial and resurrection and then the disciples miss the point he tells them again in chapter 9 and then they miss the point and they're arguing about who's the greatest and now here we see the exact same thing but this is central in the mind of christ what he came to do why he's in front of the group why he's Head on, intensely looking, staring down Jerusalem. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Christ, on his heart, is that task that he came to do. I think my mic just went out. Sorry. It's probably dead. That's a preach like they did in old school days. It's all good. So he goes on, right? And they're heading toward Jerusalem, that holy city. Jerusalem, if you know, the place is called the city of peace. Jerusalem is paved with the blood of the prophets. How is this a city of peace? Jerusalem has hated anyone who has come to preach the counsel of God against them. They killed the prophets of old when they would say, repent. Judgment is coming. They threw Jeremiah in the pit, right? No prophet it has never gone well for them in Jerusalem. And Jesus knows, I head to that city, that holy city filled with self-righteous Pharisees who think that they don't need atonement, who think that they perform atonement on behalf of the people. And he refers to himself as the Son of Man. If you know the Son of Man is a title that's given to someone who's going to have dominion and power. And Daniel, you see the Ancient of Days, meaning the Father, handing over the kingdom to the Son of Man. What does that mean? He's saying, you're going to receive an inheritance. Now the Jews would have never thought that the Son of Man would have to first die to gain that reward. But Christ is showing the Son of Man, the powerful Son of Man, who will receive a kingdom, who will receive honor, power, dominion, and glory. That Son of Man must first pass through the waters of judgment. Must first be flogged and killed. Must first be crowned with thorns before he receives the crown of glory in heaven. Before he is exalted on the throne, the Son of Man must first be exalted on the cross. Before he's lifted up in heaven, he'll be lifted up to die on the cross. That's what he's getting at. You think the Son of Man 
It's only going to be beautiful for his winning, his winning uh, militia against sin. No, there's going to be death that comes. And sinners will be the ones to judge him. You ever think about that? The Lord of glory, the only holy person to have ever lived on this side of eternity. The sinless one. The spotless one. Looking at people that he created. Being judged by them. Being scorned by them. The just judge of all of eternity is being judged by unjust individuals. That's what he says. I'll be handed over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked and spat upon. Verse 34 lays that out clearly. Now, I struggle, even from an emotional perspective, I struggle to understand how anyone, even if they're indifferent to Christianity, how anyone could see the physical sufferings of Christ and not be moved in their spirit, to be spat upon, to be completely treated as an animal, right? To rip his beard out, to flog him with the cat of nine tails every single time, ripping chunks of skin out of his body. The physical torment of Christ is enough. But listen, if we could be given a glimpse of the spiritual torment that took place at Calvary's cross, the physical torment is just the first layer. That's the ice, the, the, the iceberg, the, the, the tip of the iceberg. But underneath that, the, the spiritual realities of Christ being abandoned by his Father, by the sins of his people being laid upon him, goes far deeper than these emotion, than, than these physical realities. But this is what it cost. Why did he have to do this? Listen, to pay for the sins of his people, to satisfy the wrath of God in our place and in our stead. For all who would come to him would come to him seeing the suffering Messiah. This payment, this canceling of our debt, could have been done no other way. It cost the lamb his blood, the precious blood that flowed at Calvary. See, but the beauty is to have a dying Savior is one thing. To have a dying Messiah is one thing. But Christ never leaves out that he will rise again, that he will rise from the dead. See, in most contemporary preaching, all we hear about is the death of Christ, the death of Christ, the death of Christ. But listen, even that's sometimes shallow in, in most preaching. But what we need as Christianity is to realize our Savior, He died, but He rose again. He's a living hope, and He's bringing living water to His people. Death is defeated. He's vindicated, and now He's sitting and ruling and reigning in heaven for us. Now, don't forget that, because that's, that's mightily important for the application. The suffering, the suffering of Christ. What He was doing there. The gospel laid down for us. Jesus giving of himself for others. We're going to apply this to the text in a second, but we must go on. These disciples, man, they're so thick-headed, right? Do you see what they ask? Specifically James and John in verse 35 through 37. It says, And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. It's like a little kid asking a question, right? Now, before I ask you, just promise you'll say yes, right? I sometimes do that with Isabella when I want junk food, right? Now, before I ask you what I'm about to say, just make sure you'll say yes before I ask you, right? That's what these men are doing. And then other Gospels actually reveal their mother is there with them. What a dysfunctional family, right? You think you have a dysfunctional family? Imagine your mother coming and asking, hey, can you have my boys sit at the right hand and your left hand in glory? Right? We all see it in sports parents when kids aren't getting playing time and the mother goes up to the coach and says, hey, can you put my son in? That, that's kind of embarrassing. But imagine going up to Christ and asking, can you sit my boys at your right and your left? That's what's going on here. They're so thick-headed. They want to be able to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom without ever suffering for those benefits of the kingdom. They want to sit in positions of authority, prestige, uh, with prestige but never wondering how is it that one even attains that prestige or that glory what a funny silly question to ask is it not now the reality is what we should see here is actually in our hearts there's times when we ask things of the lord 
where we ask, not in a real sense, to be seated at his right or his left, but we ask for, Lord, if you just would open up this door for me. Lord, if you would allow this to happen. And we start to tell the Lord what we think should happen in our lives. And I just love, I love Christ's response. It's so gentle here. And it is with much of us, when we pray before the Lord, there's times that we ask things that we literally have no idea what we're asking. If the Lord were to grant the permissions of our heart, our lives would be in utter ruin, dear church. But see Christ, he's gentle, he's kind. There's times where he rebukes his disciples, but here he does not. He tells them gently and kindly, he says, what do you want me to do for you? Right? He knows their heart, he knows what's coming, yet he still asks. I just told you, I'm about to be killed. I'm about to be spat on. I'm about to be mocked. And all you care about is where you'll be seated in glory. What is it that you want? Right? What is it that you want? They ask again to be seated for him at his right hand and at his left hand. Verse 30, and Jesus says, you do not know what you are asking. In effect, Christ is saying, brothers, brothers, if I gave you what you wanted, you have no idea what it would cost you to sit on that throne. You don't know what it takes to be seated in that position of authority you would have to suffer for the sins of your people. You would be the atoning sacrifice to sit on those thrones. You would have to take upon yourself the wrath of Almighty God on behalf of your people to receive that level of glory. You don't know what those seats cost, is what Christ is saying. You don't know what you're asking. Right? Because what we see here is Christ saying in verse 39, are you, oh sorry, verse 30, are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? What's Christ talking about? The cup that I drink and the, baptized with, with the baptism that I receive. The cup of judgment. You read the Old Testament. You see Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane saying, let this cup pass from me. Very simply, the cup is the wrath of God. Filled up in that cup that Christ would metaphorically drink was the punishment for the sins of all those who would come to him the church, and in the baptism. What's he speaking about there? At the bottom of the ocean, if any of us were, were to plunge deep enough, we would be crushed by the sheer weight of the water. There's parts of the ocean that no human instrument can even go to. Submarine windows crash in because the weight and the pressure of the water is such that none could withstand that weight. And Christ is saying, are you able to, to be baptized, to be pushed and plunged to the waters of baptism so deep that the weight of the sins of the people will crush you. Are you able to withstand that? And then these silly men in verse 39 tell him, we are able. We are able. They have no clue. They have no ability to understand what they're saying. Again, I can assure you, church, there's been Hundreds of times where we prayed for things, where we've asked Christ to give us things. And we think, we're able to do it, Lord. We can weather that storm. We can handle that pressure. I can take that new responsibility. There's times where we've asked possibly for job promotions. And we think, Lord, if you just gave me this job, I'd be able to handle it. I'd have more for my family. Not knowing if you've been given that job, your life would have been ruined. You see, the, the beauty of Christ is He knows our hearts. Even when we speak utter foolishness, like we are able to be baptized with the baptism that Christ has. Christ is still answering kindly and lovingly, though He does have the reality that they will suffer something to the same reality of what Christ will suffer. Verse 39, He says, at the end of it, And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. So what Christ is saying here is, listen, you're going to have to suffer. The Christian life is one of suffering and persecution. You won't be doing an atoning work. You won't be redeeming anything. You won't be paying for the sins of others. But rest be assured, if you come, follow me. You will you will be baptized in the same way that I am baptized. You will drink of the same cup. Not a redeeming work, right? But what we actually see is in Acts chapter 12, this James, 
This James who's asking to be seated at the right hand or the left hand of Christ, this James is killed. He's killed. He's martyred for his faith. So Christ is in effect saying, look, you don't know what you're asking. You don't know what you are in, truly asking me to do for you. But be careful because there will come a day where you will be baptized in the same way that I was baptized. And James, this James, dies. Dies. He's martyred. Killed for his faith. And this John in Revelation is set to an island in Patmos saying, I have been numbered with those who've been persecuted in the church. So rather than these men saying, we are able to weather the storm. We're able to do what you say, Christ. What they should have said is, Lord, we're not able, but give us the grace to be able to withstand when persecution comes. Listen, we, sometimes we watch those movies of, you know, Hitler and Nazi and the Jews, and we think, how could these Jews have just let Hitler do this to them? Why were there no pastors rising up in Germany? Why were there no, no patriotic uh, Germans who saw their neighbors being killed by Hitler? Man, if I was alive, I would have rose up and, and went against Hitler. No, you wouldn't have. That's showing an arrogant heart. Rather than saying, well, Lord, we are able to do this. Well, we should say, Lord, I don't know if I'm able to do it. I don't know if I could withstand the storm. I don't know if I have the ability within myself to do that which you've called me to do. But what I need is not to put confidence in the flesh. Rather, what I should be saying is, I don't know if I'm able. But should that time come, Lord, would you grace me to be able to withstand that? Christian, as you are embarking in the Christian life, rather than carrying the assumption that you could do the Christian life, rather than assuming that you're able to do all that the Lord has called you to do, the more wise thing to do would, to, would be to say, Lord, I don't know if I could do this. I don't know if I could be a father to your glory, a mother to your glory. I don't know if I could serve in the church, be this employee, be a godly citizen, whatever it is, I'm not sure. But Lord, what I am sure of is I need your grace. I need your mercy. As a psalm we, we read in the call to worship, I'll look up my eyes to the heavens and I won't stop looking until you have mercy on me. That should have been the more wise response by James and John here. Not that we are able, but Lord, if that's our lot, would you help us to be able to withstand? In verse 41 these disciples can, oh sorry, verse 40, but to sit at my right hand or my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom, had, who, whom it has been prepared. All Christ is saying is, look, you're worried about glory. You're worried about what's to come. This life has sufficient worries for itself. Don't worry for tomorrow. Don't worry about where you'll be in eternity. No, this life is sufficient for your, all your concerns, your cares. Just worry how you're living today, Right? That day will come, the Father will give to all whom it's due. But for this life, you just worry about what you are able to withstand. And verse 41, And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant and James and John. This is hilarious, right? James and John are asking a question about who can sit in heaven, where, and Christ is kind of giving them a hard time, telling them, you're going to be baptized, you're going to be killed for what you're saying. And the other ten are like, Dang, I should ask that first, right? They beat me to the punch. Why didn't I think of that question? Now I'm at to sit in the lower seats, right? They're indignant. They're upset. They're jealous. Again, this is common amongst them. In Mark 9, we see them arguing about who's going to be the greatest. These disciples cannot help but to be pulled into a position of wanting authority over others, of wanting power of wanting ruling abilities. Now I'm convinced, dear church, that this is in the heart of all of us. A desire to have control, a desire to lead others, a desire to have influence, a desire to have prominence, a desire that our job titles will cause others to think how wise we are. We, by nature, would rather sit on, sit on thrones then serve those who are sitting on thrones. We, by nature, would rather have others cater to our needs rather than being humble and submitting to the needs of others. And that's why Christ highlights this in the Gentiles in verse 42. 
because he knows this is the heart of man. He says, and Jesus said to them, called to them and said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. Christ is telling them, that's the world. You're worried about positions of authority and dominance and control. That's the world. That's the Gentiles. They have a ruling class and a serving class. They have the noble and the peasants. There's a group who leads and a group who submits. Listen, I, I don't want to go too far into this, but listen real quick. This country was founded on these principles. The founders of our constitutions knew that there's a desire within man to want to lord it over people. There's a desire in the heart of man to want to have complete power over a people. So let's create a constitution that limits that power. Government by the people, for the people. Right? And then the crafters of the constitution knowing how sinful man is. And if we vote men in, guess who those people are? The government is still made up of men. So the government's not the answer. It's a checks and balances keeping each other accountable. So Christ here is actually preaching something pretty solid. The Gentiles, they lord it over the people. They want people to rule. And now we can have wisdom. You see how the Bible applies to all of life, even in the framing of a constitution. I'm completely certain that the founders of our country knew we have to limit the power of the ruling class. This was in the heart of the framers of the Constitution, knowing the Gentiles, even Christ admits, the Gentiles want to lord it over the people. Let's set a checks and balances in place. But listen, it happens in the church. That's what Christ is saying. right? He's saying, look at the world. They have rulers and they have servants. They have governors and they have people to submit to the governors. It should not be this way with you, church. That's what Christ is saying. If we look out to the Modern, to modern Christianity, what do we see? Pastors who do nothing except stand in the pulpit and go home and collect the check. They come back to the pulpit, they go home and they collect the check. Never, never serving their people. We've created a system of people in charge and people to submit to those people in charge. Even within the church, when Christ is warning us, it should not be the same with you. Verse 43, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. The greatest in the kingdom is the one who serves, dear church. The greatest in the kingdom is the one who loves others. We often think, man, the great ones of the, of the kingdom, they're the ones who are preaching. They're the ones who are up there standing and giving messages. Those are the greatest, right? No, the greatest in the kingdom are the ones who serve one another. This is countercultural. No other, have you ever thought of this? No other system, no other kingdom, no other group, no other, whatever you want to call this, collection of people, no other kingdom is led by the one who was serving the most. Every system of man is people in charge, right? You think of businesses, CEOs, you think of presidents, you even think even in the gang world, it's someone who's calling the shots, and everyone's submitting to that man. But only in Christianity, only in Christianity is it this, that the ones who are the greatest are not the shot callers. The ones who are the greatest are the ones who are serving one another out of love and respect and joy. Why? Why? It's because our leader did the same. It's because Christ led the way in service. It's because Christ saying, I did not come to be served, but to serve. So what we, sh what we should see in Christianity is that lived out. Christ, the Lord of glory, going up, serving a people by offering his life for them. The church should then see their leader, see the champion of their faith, and think if he led us by serving us, how are we not going to now love others and serve them? The greatest in the kingdom are those who lay down their life because they saw Jesus lay down his life. The greatest in the kingdom are those who serve because they saw Jesus serve them. Verse 44, And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. And slave of all. 
That's, that's farther than a servant. Must be a doulos of all. Slaves for one another. In fact, you know what the early Christians were called? They were called Christanoids. There was something called the Caesar Anoids, which meant the slaves of Caesar. And there's something called the Christanoids, meaning the slaves of Christ. But see, we start thinking, man, if I'm somebody's slave, they'll take advantage of me. And they'll start making crazy requests of me because I'm their slave. They're going to ask me to do this, that, or the other. No, but you see, we are one body, dear church. We are one group, Christ himself being the head. So as I'm serving one another, as you are serving one another, what is taking place? We're just serving ourselves because we're one body. The more that I look at a brother or sister and I serve them, the more they'll be built up and the body stronger. And then they'll be able to serve brother or sister. They'll be built up, now the body's stronger. But now when we are all collectively doing things on our own, when all of us are having our own little lives and never being together, that's a weak body. That's a body that's ready to break. If I give you, right, the scripture uses our bodies as an example of this. If I tr tried picking something up without using other parts of my body, if I just try to use the strength of my finger to lift something up, rather than employing my wrist, my forearm, my biceps, my triceps, my shoulders to help do that task, working together, serving one another to make the burdens of the church light. You see, Christ is saying, we need to take this in mind. The one who is great will be the servant of all. The hard part is that in Christianity, the second that I say service, your mind thinks of serving in this ministry, serving in this capacity, doing a Sunday school, preaching, da 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 da, right? Our mind, especially because we're from the USA and we're so engulfed in American Christianity, when I say service, you think ministry, right? Some people even ask, well, what's your ministry? I don't have a ministry, I'm a Christian. All of life is my ministry. So I just want to make sure and clarify real, real quick to do. It, to be in service does not mean that you're signing up your name to do something for the church. No, to be in service, it means that you are enlisted in the king's army, daily attending to the needs of others and your own, own soul. I love what Spurgeon says. He, has, says. he says, it has come to be a dreadfully common belief in the Christian church that only the man who has a call is the man who devotes all his time to what he has called the ministry. You could say woman too for women's ministries. Whereas all Christian service is ministry, dear church. You are all in ministry in some capacity or another. If you are enlisted in the church, if you are part of his body, you are in ministry. Every Christian, Spurgeon says, every Christian has a call to some kind of ministry or another. You are as much serving God and looking after your own children and training them up in God's fear, and minding the house, and making your household a church for God, as you would be if you had been called to lead an entire army into battle for the Lord of hosts. You see what I'm saying? Look at your life. Every single area of your life is as important as another if it's done for the glory of God, and it's as if you're leading out a battle. We, so, we get so convoluted and, and, and confused by what Christian ministry is. It isn't the leader and then having his little group. No, Christian ministry is living your life to the glory of God and serving others, wherever that is, wherever that is. In verse 45, the, the crux of the passage, the, the, where we get the source of how we do the rest of these things, this first word is so important, for, right? Christ has got experience. Uh, done explaining all this to you service to one another the greatest in the kingdom sitting on thrones right don't worry about that serve one another why verse 45 for even the son of man came to be came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many we can't miss this this is what i was talking about when you look at the death of christ when you look at what he suffered what he went through this is Christ-centered, gospel-centered service, dear church. Why must you serve? Why must you become last? Because that's what Christ did for us. Why must you serve? Because Christ served us. 
Why must we become last? Because Christ became last and least in the kingdom by offering up his life for us. This, this, this should just completely shock us. This verse should take us to an experiential reality of Christianity. The Son of Man, the one who has authority, the one who be, will be giving kingdoms and power and dominion. The Son of Man, that's a title for someone who has all power and authority. The Son of Man. The one who sits on the highest throne. He didn't come to, to be served, but to serve. The Lord of glory, God of very God, the one who's upholding the universe this very second, dear church. That man, that God man, came to serve you. Came to serve you. Now, if I could just help you illustrate this, this further. Say you went to a restaurant. And you sat down. Well, you can't do that these days anymore. But let's say you went to a restaurant and you sat down. And you saw the person that was going to come serve you was the President of the United States. You would be tripping, thinking, what are you doing here? You had to go be doing more important things, right? That's what's going on here. The most important person who ever lived. The one who has literally all authority in his hands is serving us, church. He's bowing down in condescension and serving us. And that's the fruit. That's how we serve one another. He died for us, seeing nothing good in us. He gave himself over for us, knowing that we benefited him nothing. He served us and gave us his life so that we could be enlisted in the king's army and now give our life over to him. Now, listen, I, I don't want to miss this application, right? You take an inventory of your life, right? You, you, you begin to look at what you do on a weekly basis. Just consider it, even this past week. L try to examine what you've done and ask yourself, did I serve others or did I just serve myself? Was I able to go out and help a brother or a sister? Did I encourage anyone? Was I in service to anyone? Was I a slave for anyone else this week? Or did I just gratify my own sinful desires and my own sinful flesh? Some of us think, well, you know, I'm serving my family. And that's good. That's a primary thing. That's the most important thing is to serve your family. But some of us, in the name of serving our family, turn a blind eye to everyone else and think, well, this is what I'm called to do. Yes, there's two pitfalls. One is you serve everyone else and you ignore your family. That's bad. We see that a lot. But the other pitfall is I serve nobody and I only care about my family. I don't see that in the New Testament. I see that nowhere in the New Testament. I see Peter, who has a family, going out and serving brothers and sisters and becoming a missionary. I see people in the New Testament who I don't even hear about their family because they're serving their brothers and sisters. But I know that they're serving the family because they couldn't do this without doing the home. I understand service starts in the home, amen, but it doesn't end in the home. Service must extend the walls of your home, dear church. If your, time is, if your family is getting all your time, then you have be, made not ministry an idol, you've made the family an idol. And God has never called us to do such things. In fact, if we think about last week's sermon, Christ said you'll lose mother and father, brother or sister and children, but you'll receive hundredfolds. So if you want to serve their family, it includes your blood family, but it must include the family of God. As I look around, I'm looking at my family of God. And it's to you that I'm most indebted to, along with my blood family. It's not one or the other. It's both. It's both. So when we think about service, it cannot be limited to the ones we care about most. It's got to be extended to all who are part of God's kingdom, especially as it pertains to our local church. Paul uses language like, our hearts are being knitted together. You know what that means? It means we have to be kind of close to knit our hearts together. We're being held by the bonds of peace. You know what that means? We have to actually come together and enjoy one another. 
Now, I don't want to make this a law to keep because that's what we think as Christians. Now I must do that in order to earn favor. No, we must do that because we've been given favor. Right? Here's the gospel. We don't do things to get there. Right? No, the gospel's here. Now we do things because we've been given the gospel, part of which is being called to the service of one another. Psalm 102, 100 verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. As we're doing these things, we have to be doing it with joy. If there's no gladness in your serving, if you're grunting and sighing and complaining the whole time, then don't even serve. Because that's even more hypocritical, hypocritical, right? You're doing something, but you're complaining the whole time. Just don't even serve at that point. Don't even go to a brother's or sister's house. But when you do it, serve the Lord with gladness. Because that's what Christ did, right? We think of the Garden of Gethsemane and Christ saying, <clears throat> let this cup pass for me. So we think he didn't really want to go to the cross. No, that's not the case. Because Hebrew says, for the joy that was set before him. <clears throat> for the joy that was set before him, he endured the pain of the cross. Christian, for the joy that is set before you, your family, your church family, suffer for one another, serve one another, be a slave for one another. The genuine Christian, full of the love of God, cannot be an idler. I believe that many prof professing Christians are cold and uncomfortable. This is so huge right here. When I look at a Christian who's suffering, who's, who's distant, who looks unhappy, who looks small and just his disposition, his countenance is always one of depressed. I think it's because of this. Listen to what Spurgeon says. I believe that many professing Christians are cold and uncomfortable and sad and depressed because they are doing nothing for their Lord. But if they actively served Him, their blood will begin to circulate spiritually and it would be well with Him. This is our duty, Christian, to love God and to love neighbor. So please, I would beg you, I would just urge you to realize what you've been called to do. And as I close, I just want to close with this one thought, right? That's the service element, but it's rooted in Christ's service to us. That's what enables us. That's what helps us. It's to see what Christ has first done to us, and now we do that unto others. But dear church, so that your heart may be filled and full of Christ, I ask you to meditate. If you've heard nothing else, I ask that you just would tune in at this second what God have you ever heard of that serves His creatures? What God, what Almighty, what Lord, what Omnipotent One have you ever heard of in this life that doesn't primarily demand things, but He first gives Himself over to His people? Only the Christian God, dear church. You have the other gods of this world demanding money, demanding time, demanding sacrifice, demanding X, Y, Z. But the Christian God is a God who Christ says did not come to be served, but came to serve. Church, do you realize that we have the only true and living God who loves us so deeply that He came to serve us. He came to give His life for us. No other God. I love that song that says, Who is a pardoning God like Thee? No other God compares to our God, church. No other Christ, no other Messiah, no other Savior has ever done what, what, what our Christ has done. So as you meditate on these things, as you think about serving one another, may it be first rooted in the fact that we have the only Christian God who has ever served His people. All these other gods and idols are demanding, and the Christian God is giving. What a beautiful reality to help us serve one another even this week. Let's pray. Lord, we are so encouraged and we're so, I would pray, just blown away that the one who created all things, even us, serves us. The one who has a cattle on a thousand hills is, it has joy, has joy as he's serving us. He's looking over us and laughing and having true joy in his heart for his people. Lord, can we not take this in and realize if our God is able to do that for us, may not flow out of us naturally to serve one another. Help us, Lord, <clears throat> to not see service as a law to keep to gain salvation, but to see service for one another, 
rooted in the gospel that's been purchased for, for us by the blood of Christ. In his name, amen. Amen. We please stand as we sing the closing song for the doxology. This morning's benediction will be somewhat unique because I want to take us to Leviticus 9 very quickly. And I want to read these verses to you. Leviticus 9, 22. Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. And he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. And Moses and Aaron went up into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the piece of the fat on the altar. And when, they, when the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their face. Moses and Aaron stick out their hands to bless the people. Why? Because the offering was accepted, dear church. The offering was accepted. So now, as we look at what Christ has done in Hebrews his perfect sacrifice for us. I just would ask that you would realize these people fell on their face because they saw the Lord of glory accepting the sacrifice as perfect and complete. They would have seen peace. They would have thought the God who was going to kill me is now for me. He's accepted the, uh, the offering on our behalf. Now listen to what Christ does for us in Hebrews 9, 12 and 14. He entered once for all into the holy places not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. Dear church, your sins are forgiven. You are sprinkled with the blood of the Lamb to serve the living God. Now do that this week, dear church. You're dismissed.